You're listening to And welcome to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yue. And I'm Rira Yu. And on this episode, we are joined by Vanessa Le to talk about her debut novel, The Last Blood Carver, a Vietnamese American inspired sci fi fantasy story. As always, Books and Boba is supported by our listeners over at patreon.com slash books and boba. So if you'd like to become a bigger part of our book club, please head on over and become a member. Um, our Patreon supporters get access to um, our members only Discord server where you can talk to fellow club members in real time, um, as well as monthly bonus podcasts. So um, check it out. We appreciate everyone who's become a member and hope you will join us. But yeah, really excited to bring you this conversation with Vanessa Lay. Um, her novel brings together so many themes and genre conventions that I really love. It is a sci-fi, fantasy, action, medical murder mystery. And it was a lot of fun to chat with uh, Vanessa about her inspirations for everything. Yeah, I mean, like Marvin said, this book is a lot of things. Uh, the publishers describes it as a tantalizing romance of these violent delights meets the mechanical wonders of Cinder. <laughs> and I'm just like, yeah, the romance part, I I, I get. Cinder, not so much. <laughs> um, but if you guys are like fans of uh, Legend of Korra, Avatar The Last Airbender, I feel like you guys will um, see familiar traits in the magical medicine ability that our main character Nika has. Uh, Nika is a blood carver and she's able to change people's anatomy and also like cure and alter their bodies with just one touch. Kind of reminded me of bloodbending. <laughs> so uh, I was pretty stoked to read this book. It did not disappoint. Yeah. So um, please enjoy our conversation with Vanessa Lay. And we are here with Vanessa Lay, the author of The Last Blood Carver. Welcome to the show, Vanessa. Hi, thank you for having me. Okay, so you're in medical school right now, which is like the total opposite of the arts. So I'm curious as to how did you get into writing? And at what point did you realize you wanted to pursue this professionally? Yeah, I said, I think... When I'm thinking about my childhood, I don't think there's a moment where I really remember getting into writing. Uh, for a lot of Asian kids, my mom likes to tell the story. During our first birthday, we have that you know first choosing ceremony where you lay a bunch of items out and we choose one that kind of determines our future. Allegedly, according to my mom, I chose a pen. So maybe that was some kind of uh, omen about my future. But I feel like I've written for as long as I can remember. And I think my early stuff was just really derivative works of the the kind of things that I was reading at the time. So, yeah, I guess there wasn't a time. I just have been writing for as long as I can remember. And were you an avid reader growing up? Were stories something that you just naturally gravitated towards? Yes, I I really loved reading. I think my parents in particular fostered a lot of that. I do remember just going to the bookstore and getting a bunch of books and reading all of it in one sitting. Um, my mom also read a lot to me when I was growing up. She, you know, read me Tale of Despero, uh, Bridge of Terabithia, all those classic growing up books. And when I was in high school, I participated in something called Oregon Battle of the Books. It was a book competition where you would just read 12 books and then memorize trivia from them and, you know, uh, compete against other schools. So I guess yeah, I read, read a lot as a child. I definitely read a lot less fun stuff nowadays, but I'm trying to maintain a healthy love of reading. Yeah, I think that's really cool that uh, you picked up a pen during like your first birthday ceremony because uh, I don't know, it's like it, it it's fate. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, and and that's actually what I picked up too when I at, during like my first birthday, I picked up a calligraphy brush and I ended oh, up going okay. to writing 
school. So maybe there is some truth to that. I think um, so. I like to believe so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel like sometimes when kids pick up something that's not like the money, right? I feel like people, some parents get really disappointed, yeah. right? Uh, well, according to my family, I have three brothers and two of them went through the ceremony. The older one picked the money and now he's, you know, doing very well for himself. And <laughs> my younger one picked up a mirror and that's very in line with the you know, his personality. So I, I do think there's some truth to it. You know, you, you like what you like as a, as a kid. And, you know, yeah, it's, I like, guess it's we the know. most pure, pure form of like, I want to do this. Right. Yeah. So for uh, when you started to write, did you get introduced to it through like a creative writing class at school? Or was it something that uh, you started doing like earlier, like journaling or fanfic writing or whatever form of creative writing out there? I don't think I ever wrote fanfic, but um, as I mentioned, a lot of my works were very derivative of the stuff that I read. So the first thing I ever remember actually reading in, or writing in a long format that could be considered a novel, but probably wasn't anything close, was um, handwriting out uh, a story about cat assassins in line with Warriors Cat series. So it was very much about, like, very similar to the things I consumed. Um, and I do remember a certain point in my childhood where my mom would offer 25 cents per story that we wrote, trying to keep us busy, I guess, or motivated to do something. Um, and I did make a lot of money off that. So there's there must be something there, um, something to be said about, you know, financially motivating your kids to produce content. But yeah, I didn't have, I would say, any kind of formal writing structured course until high school when I took a historical fiction class in my senior year, which I, I found so fun. It was the first time I was ever writing for fun in in high school rather than an essay. It was like creative writing. And I think that's the first class that I took. And it also laid a lot of good groundwork for how to research because it was historical fiction. So we had to do a lot of research for world building. And um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that class. That's really cool that your school offered like creative writing and um, historical fiction. Like that was something that my school didn't offer. And I, I kind of wish that we had that yeah. opportunity. Um, but there is something to be said about bribing kids to be better at academic stuff. Right? I remember when I was a kid, um, there was a program called Book It, where if you finish a book, you get like a voucher uh, for a free personal pan pizza at Pizza Hut. <laughs> this is back when Pizza Hut had like sit down restaurants. And I, I read so many books through that program. Um, so there's definitely oh, something to be goodness. said. Um, and yeah, I definitely was like motivated by food. Was, I see. Yeah, it was about money for me. Maybe it still is. For me, it was more of uh, being competitive because like, you know how libraries, they have like readathons and um, oh, oh, like they have competitions I, where like, oh, who who's read like the most books this summer? And oh, uh, I, totally I would just remember that now. I would just do it out of sheer competition because I'm like, I am going to be number one. But then uh. there was always that one kid who would uh, who would borrow all the horse books or all oh, the comic books and they would beat me. And I'm like, oh, God, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that unlocked a memory. I do remember we also had those kind of competitions for medals. And yet you got to go for gold, you know, you can't settle for, <laughs> for silver. Yeah. So it looks like you have a great love for speculative fiction. And I wanted to ask, like, what were some of the books that inspired you to get into like this genre? In terms of getting into the genre, the first book series that I remember just absolutely devouring is Skullduggery Pleasant by, by Derek Landy. I think he was actually an Australian author. I don't know if even his books had sold all the rights in the U.S. because I remember it was so hard to find them. You had to go to like specific libraries, but I tracked down, I didn't couldn't even find the whole series. I only read like so many of them, but it was just about a girl and her like partner, skeleton, mage, mentor. And I just thought that was the coolest thing. <laughs> and the the dialogue was quippy and fun. And I think that was pretty foundational to the, the kind of writing that I do nowadays. But in terms of specifically writing The Last Blood Carver and this book, um, getting back into writing since my childhood, because I stopped for a long time, um, one of the big influences was N.K. Jemisin. She wrote 
the Broken Earth trilogy, um, which I actually haven't read all of, but I read a couple of her short stories. Um, and she just writes science fantasy with such care and diligence and and knowledge and depth to it. It's just so fascinating. And I think it was her magic systems and her world building that inspired me to write a science fiction, science magic, science fantasy story about what I personally knew, which at the time was only really medicine, not anything cool like geology or, or whatnot. But it was reading those books and seeing science in such a fantastical and magical environment that made me really feel like, oh, I found a, a genre that's really calling to me that I hadn't thought of before. Yeah, I feel like you made medicine seem pretty cool in your book, so congrats <laughs> on that. Good to know, good to um, know. Speaking of your book, uh, would you like to tell our listeners about your your DB novel, The Last Book Cover? Yeah, so I call it a medical magic murder mystery. That's just the like <laughs> fun, fun tongue twister that I've been using. Um, it is about a girl named Yika who can alter anatomy with a touch, who is bought and sold on the black market to a aristocratic an aristocratic family who is looking to heal the last witness of their father's murder. So yeah, a murder mystery, a fun little romp. But um, I like to say that it's really more about legacy, losing it and trying to preserve it and feeling like you are emburdened by your family's heritage and what it means to honor it. So yeah, I was really writing about something really personal to myself at the time. Yeah, I think the world that you created in The Last Blood Carver is really cool. I love how uh, medicine and magic come together. Um, what was the inspiration for uh, building that magic system and building this world? And um, I guess like when did, I guess like the first idea of this novel start to uh, germinate in your mind? Um, that's a really good question. So when I was getting back into writing, because I had stopped for most of college to focus on my medical studies, I was kind of feeling it out and trying to find this sweet spot of what I wanted to write. And with each new story that I wrote, it started getting closer and closer to who I was as a person. And I think The Last Blood Cover was the first time it really struck home. Um, so everything about this world and everything about the magic and world building was really inspired by my very personal experiences. In terms of the world, I consider myself a product of two things, like Western culture and Eastern culture. I feel like I am naturally, and a lot of Asian immigrants I feel might share the sentiment is we're, we're a dichotomy. So I wanted to write a world that wasn't strictly Western, nor was it strictly Eastern. It was kind of this mix. And Dumas came about as kind of a representation of Asian America in general. And I was really inspired by a lot of Chinatown vibes, um, like steampunky Chinatown vibes. And one thing I wanted to really play with was this idea of, you know, why do people immigrate over. It's like the idea of the American dream, that you can be anything that you want to be. And like, what is America to an Asian immigrant? So I, I really latched onto this idea of the American dream, where we are promised that if we work hard, I, I'm sure this is something like a lot of parents just tell you growing up, it's like, you work hard enough and you get very far in life. Um, so I wanted to make Dumas a meritocratic city, where you succeed by merit, because I felt that really represented what a lot of uh, people think America is. And um, so it became this uh, metaphor for the the kind of America that I live in, this like meritocratic, half Vietnamese, half American world that um, I really wanted to put my my character in. And then in terms of the rest, it was more and more of just what I was going through at the time. I was studying medicine and I really liked that entire realm of science. So I was like, the magic system has to naturally be medicine. And Nika as a character is a daughter of immigrants because that was very personal to me. And just her story in general was about feeling like she was losing her culture because she had lost her family, which was something that I was going through because my grandma was going through dementia at the time. So it really did feel like um, 
I was growing farther apart from from the pillars of my culture. So it, I guess, it was a very long answer, but TLDR, I just really wanted to write something that encapsulated how I felt at the time, and naturally those confines of the world and the magic system came about. Yeah, it's really cool to read in your book. Um, you know, one of your themes in your book is this conflict or this tension between like modern medicine and traditional medicine, and in some ways like Western versus Eastern medicine, and how your main character has this really great power where she can influence the anatomy and physiology of of people um but because she's coming up against a scientific community who are skeptical of things that are like mystic in nature and so her powers are downplayed and even vilified i I really like how you explore that like that tension in your book yeah thank you yeah so like the city state of uh tumas they celebrate science like uh you mentioned and it kind of parallels nika's healing abilities and Yet they have this fear of her abilities. They call her uh, a blood carver, and that's not what she calls herself or what her family uh, call their abilities. And I'm just curious as to how you develop this contrast, this juxtaposition, this, um, I guess, like battle between modern medicine versus uh, traditional heart soothing. Yeah, so I think a lot of that came about um in part because I am both an artist and a scientist in my own self-conception. And I feel like naturally people believe those two are dichotomy and I don't feel that way. I feel like art lends itself naturally to science. And then in my experience writing this book, science also lends itself naturally to art. And I, when I was writing this book, I felt that a lot of um, her battle between... You know, you know, being called a heart sooth and being called a blood carver was not only about how people perceived her as a person and the idea of um, how much does it matter how much how much does it matter what people perceive you as compared to how you perceive it yourself, but it was also um, dealing with this idea of humanities in medicine and how the two <clears throat> can actually go hand in hand and elevate each other as compared to what a lot of people think, which is that they dichotomize each other. So I really wanted to show that um, there is a huge component of connection and nurturing and care in medicine. Naturally, through heart soothing, to use it as an ability, you have to touch someone. So when she isn't able to use it, it's not only depriving herself of, you know, a gift, but it's also depriving herself of touch and connection. So I think when we when I was thinking about that as a magic system, I was really thinking about the humanistic side of medicine, about what it means to not be able to connect with someone empathetically and physically when you, when you take care of them, like what is it if you were just taking care of them through a machine? And I I think all those questions were, um, I was, those were the things I was trying to answer as I was feeling my way through the first draft. I think it's really cool that you, uh, compare heart soothing to the arts and how you have how she like merges uh, humanities with science because uh, I actually like took it quite literally because I was like oh my god Western med- medicine versus Asian medicine and how um, the Western world views uh, traditional Asian medicine with like distrust but um, over the years they've kind of co opted a lot of um, Asian medicine um, practices like gua sha and um, acupuncture. So I thought that was like, I was like, I, I hadn't thought of it that way. That's uh, that was really clever of you. Um, was that something that um, like, did you think about like traditional Asian medicine versus Western medicine when you were crafting uh, the medicine practices of your world? Yeah. So I, I think that's a really valid interpretation and it was something I was thinking about as well um I really am intrigued by by Chinese medicine or or Eastern medicine in general because when I was growing up a lot of the things that my grandmother taught me like cupping or you know I remember just sitting at home in uh, the basement and we were just like cupping my grandpa's back every weekend so a lot of those things, I agree, are just so fascinating. And a lot of therapies, 
of um, Eastern medicine and Eastern herbalism have been, you know, scientifically um, examinated down to, you know, chemical components to see how they work. But sometimes that doesn't need to happen. Sometimes it just works. And I, I agree there is also a benefit to uh, a lot of traditional medicines. And, and of course, I'm you know, a med student, I feel like a lot of the stuff that we like to promote is scientifically backed. And I don't want to, you know, suggest alternative therapies for everything. But that being said, as an adjuvant therapy or as a supplemental type of care that brings people comfort because it's from their culture, those kind of things I think are invaluable. And just, um, I guess this is a, a huge medical tangent more than a writing tangent, but <laughs> Just having those um, themes working with heart soothing and and uh, and the medicine seen in Dumas, the kind of uh, scientific medicine, I think it was definitely a something that I'm really glad that, or I'm I'm really hoping that readers are are noticing and picking up on as well. Yeah, something that really struck me from your book is you know, your, your main character, Nika, has this amazing ability to be able to affect human physiology through touch. And that's like an ability that like I'm sure any like healthcare professional would like love to have, right? The ability to go in and um, armed with just your knowledge of human physiology and anatomy, be able to, you know, clear blood clots and fix things internally without having yeah. to go in um, under the knife. Um, but because of who she is and where she comes from, her powers are not only minimized, like we mentioned, but also vilified, right? Like people fear her for her power. And that really struck me as, you know, like a minority living in, you know, the United States where a person's, you know, ethnic heritage background can totally override any of their skills that can honestly benefit society. Um, and the fact that, you know, your setting is like this modern, you know, not scientific utopia, but like a place where reason and logic like you mentioned um reign supreme but they still haven't gotten over like basic racism right yeah i think okay well your question made me think of a few lines that i i wrote one of which being um that at some point in this story she points out the hypocrisy of the fact that people spurn her but they will put themselves in anesthesia under sleep um underneath a surgeon's scalpel and like how is that any less dangerous than letting her touch them. Um, so that really definitely touches in on just the perception of, of prejudice. Um, so in, in that regard, I think what I was really trying to get at in terms of making Nika feel that deep down she is a healer, but no one else seeing her that way was because of something I was going through. I was really struggling to get into medical school at that time. Um, and, you know, I've been fortunate now, but when I was writing, my feelings then were that I felt like I was healer. I felt that that was my pathway. But to put your application out there and to be judged by a, a ton of schools and to be told by a lot of people that like, like, no, you're not like good enough to get into our school or like maybe this path isn't right for you. Well, they wouldn't say that outright, hopefully. But <laughs> um, just to have that uh, judgment and rejection and being put on that kind of display really makes you wonder, like, how much of a healer am I if nobody else feels that way about me? So that was my uh, inspiration from add to adding that part of Nika's story where she's really grappling with how people perceive her um, as compared to how she perceives herself. And I think you're right that a lot of it also has to do with racism in in the story at the very least maybe not my in my personal med school experience but um i there's this idea that she because of the way that she heals she is inherently dangerous and you have this world that is so meritocratic and they they believe that they are perfectly objective that they're only judging people by merit like anyone can do it you just have to like put yourself out there I think it's a very familiar concept that's reflective of America today um, and she finds that this is not the case you know there are ignorant people and there are biases that are just hidden and and snake-like in this social stratosphere 
that um, that really come to head when she's trying to prove who she is to people who are intent in not believing her. One of the things that uh, really caught my attention while reading your book was uh, how you depicted diaspora ex- experience within a second fantasy world. I, I don't know why, but like a lot of fantasy books that are rooted in Asian culture, like we don't really get the diaspora experience. Um, we kind of get like, okay, like this is based on Vietnamese culture. So this is alternative, uh, alternate Vietnam, but your world is very different. It's not like a reproduction of Vietnam. And your character is someone who is a child of immigrants. And um, you create kind of like this hole in your world building. There is like this absence. And I think you did a really good job, uh, like, capturing that yearning and uh, loss for a home that no longer exists. Uh, can you uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how you went about crafting that diaspora experience within the context of a second fantasy world where you kind of had to build everything from scratch? Uh, yeah, um, it's funny you say build from scratch because it was it definitely had scaffolding and framework already there. And that was just naturally my experience. So when I when I started getting back into writing after, um, you know, taking a break from it, that's what I started writing was alternate world Vietnam, like second world Vietnam set in ancient fantasy Vietnam. But when I was writing that, it just felt so dishonest to me because I have personally never even been to Vietnam. Um, it I, you know, am not a perfectly fluent Vietnamese speaker even. So when I was placing these characters in a country that, or an alternate second world country that I had never experienced. Um, I just found like my, my writing was flatter and the sentiments that I was trying to pass off as sincere naturally came across as a little disingenuous. So with each iteration of what I was writing, I slowly crept closer and closer to home until I reached the story where I, this story, the last blood carver where it is as as close to my own experience as possible which is you know why i had her parents immigrating from another island country to a uh, a city state that really is just asian american america um so i think that diasporic experience really just came about from me trying to stay true to my own experiences as possible and not trying to write over the voices of people who would know Vietnam way, way better than I do in order to actually write a good second world Vietnamese fantasy. So I, um, I know the blurb mentions that it is a Vietnam inspired world, but I would like to add an addendum that says it's actually a Vietnamese American inspired world that it takes place in. Yeah, I mean, speaking of your world building, I really enjoyed like the small pieces of like sci-fi you add in there, right? You, you have um, automatons, you have machines, but you also have carriages and things. Like, how did you go about like developing the level of technology in in your book? Because I thought it was a really fun mix. And I also wanted to just like piggyback on uh, Marvin's question right here. It really did remind me of, I guess, like. Legend of Korra, where it is like this oh, yeah. meat of like <laughs> silk punk versus steampunk. It's it was it was just like really cool to see Asian technology meets, uh, I guess, like Victorian technology <laughs> in like the Industrial Revolution as well. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to add tack in that additional detail to Marvin's question. <laughs> yeah, well, you mentioned the Industrial Revolution. I think that's where I started. Um but more specifically, as I was kind of looking into what kind of setting I wanted to place this in, I narrowed in on the general historical time period of the medical revolution rather than the industrial revolution. And um, I think to me, I don't know, I'm not any historian, but that takes place around the rise of like aseptic methods, like when you're cleaning things and you realize that germs cause illness and you're trying to be careful about that. So I uh, I really like that time period just because it seemed like that's when medicine just had this boon and this burst of revel- or like revolution and new technologies were coming out and people were redefining what it meant to go under the knife in surgery. Um, 
And of course, I didn't say completely accurate to any historical time point. Real historians will know that I took in technologies from way far in the advanced future. Like, I don't think an EEG was invented anywhere near the time period that I set the book. But, but I wanted to bring in all these medical technologies just to build this world where um, science was growing f- much faster than the city could even keep up with. And that meant a lot of new things for what medicine meant and what it meant to heal someone. And from there, I think I was just really drawn in by a lot of things that I was learning in classes and a lot of things that I was noticing in hospitals and whatnot. And for, yeah, the rest is history, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, it really seems like because the magical powers in your book is based on like real medical science, um, it allows you to kind of like flex your medical knowledge and maybe geek out a little bit. Because even in that first scene where um, Nika helps a bedridden old woman who's dealing with a heart condition, I feel like I learned a lot about medical anatomy just through that sequence. Yeah, uh, I wrote that all these like medical facts back before I was in medical school. And recently I was reading the book again, kind of terrified to find some kind of error and then get, you know, lambasted by real doctors over it. But um, I had a, a, I'm, my boyfriend is in medical school right now, two years ahead of me. And I had him read it. I'm like, is everything right? And he would just point out the tiniest little things (laughs) and, and save my life in that regard. So um, I, while I was really inspired by my education, I was not a one-woman show. I definitely had a lot of help and a lot of good fact-checkers in that regard. Not only um, do you use like your medical history and medical knowledge, I feel like there is also, um, you also utilize wartime history and how war affects medicine and medical practices. And um, the book is called The Last blood carver. And there's a reason for that. Uh, Heart soothers, they were interned by uh, the colonizers and they were experimented on. And it actually reminded me a lot of what happened in, um, like what happened to a lot of uh, Chinese soldiers during Japanese occupation. Was that something that uh, came to mind when you were drafting your book? That point in history was not something specifically that came to mind. I was really interested in particular, well, setting it during wartime. And I think this comes into play a lot more in book two, where the city is actually, you know, on the verge of war. But um, something that I really was examining with that kind of wartime and experimentation, it was what is allowed in medical ethics when we squidge our idea of humanity, when we um, squidge our idea of who is human. So um, a lot of it is inspired by my parents' story of of their, their boat story and their experiences as refugees from Vietnam. But the other part was just more speculative fiction asking, if there was a race of people with such tremendous powers, and there was a scientific meritocratic societies uh, or like Western societies that um, touted discovery and science over humanity, what might happen when those two things meet and clash? So from there, I think naturally um, I wanted to reflect something that was both rooted in, you know, my family's history, but also rooted in a little bit of scientific thinking. Or speculative thinking, excuse me. Yeah, I think you did a really good job with um, like asking those questions and coming up with your own world for like the same issues. Um, So legacy is a recurring theme in your novel. We mentioned legacy earlier on in this conversation. Um, And you question how diasporans can really honor their culture when teachings get diluted or changed with each passing generation. And this is something that Nika struggles with because um, so much of heart-soothing knowledge has been lost due to war or uh, because uh, she wasn't able to learn everything from her grandmother before she passed. Um, Just like out of curiosity, like how do you 
personally keep your Vietnamese heritage and culture alive in your daily life? I think this, um, yeah, this really came about when, as I mentioned, my I felt like myself drifting away. And I think through Nika's journey, she is asking this question and minor spoilers, kind of the conclusion that she comes to is that she doesn't need to. She doesn't have this responsibility to uphold her family's legacy or her entire bloodline, heritage, culture's legacy. It would just simply be enough to exist as someone. um, And that is proof of survival enough. Um, And I think this was something that I was grappling with at the time because I was feeling like, yeah, I won't be able to teach my children the Vietnamese language. I, you know, know it piecemeal myself. And I won't be able to, um, you know, share in these customs in a way that doesn't feel like I'm learning it again myself. So when I was writing her story, I was kind of finding my way through that question along with my own character. And I think one of the things that I realized is, you know, it's enough that I surround myself with Vietnamese family. It's enough that I engage with the culture as much as I do. And um, and one of the things that she realizes for another character is that I don't think anyone is expecting me to persevere as a, um, you know, a paradigm of my family name. I think the reason my parents have raised me the way they do is just to find my own path, whether that is more Western or more Vietnamese. I don't think they um, really care. And I think that's more a burden that I've put upon myself. And just being able to realize that it's not something that I should feel incredibly guilty for has been very relieving, especially as I... um, you know, as I've moved out of home and and gone a little bit farther from my family. Yeah. Um, So like we mentioned, your book is kind of like a mashup of a lot of different genres and themes, right? You have your child of immigrants searching for identity. You have your sci-fi fantasy action. And on top of that, a medical murder mystery. And whenever we talk to authors with like these high concept um, stories, I I always want to ask, um, what comes first, right? Is it the world, um, the themes, the characters? And at what point did you decide to add the layer of like the murder mystery? Um, I think the reason it's so high concept is because I just naturally have a very short attention span. <laughs> I feel like if I don't keep myself interested with something that's going in the, um, on in the novel, I will get bored of it. So I needed something hooky just to keep myself interested as I was writing. Uh, I I will admit the the murder mystery itself, I think actually the first thing that came about was the magic system because I wanted to write a science fantasy magic system. And at the time, it didn't necessarily have any connection to my culture and it wasn't really a metaphor any, for anything. It was just a magic system that I really wanted to write. But then I was like, oh, medicine. I think that ties naturally with like pathology, death, a murder, all these other interesting topics. So I was like... What wouldn't it be cool if, you know, you can alter anatomy um, and someone who can do this was hired to heal the last witness of a murder? So that was my backbone for the novel. And I think thinking back, I think that's the first thing that really struck me and kept me interested in writing it. But along the way, just because I was going through a lot of these things and because I find that writing is a lot more cathartic and meaningful to me when I write really sincerely and from my own experience, naturally these concepts of culture and loneliness and isolation came in and intermingled. And I think, of course, my editors and everyone who has helped me along the process has really aided in bringing out these these subtle and hidden themes that I didn't even realize that I was putting in there. I mean, I'm looking forward to, you know, the the grand epic um, continuation of your story. But I would also just read a series of Nika solving medical mysteries. I think that'd be fun too. Honestly, I, I think I have really found a genre that I love and that's medical murder mysteries. <laughs> if it's not a genre, I will, I will make it a genre. Yeah, make Nika into like, fantasy house you know like <laughs> yeah, you do a lot of yeah. oh yeah love, love that yeah 
We talked a lot about Nika, and I wanted to shift our focus to your other characters. So Nika, she is found in a black market, and the person who buys her is Mimi, who is part of uh, this very wealthy, affluent family. And uh, she kind of has a savior complex, even though uh, she she treats uh, Nika as like much better than Nika has uh, been treated by other people in um, Atsumas. Um, like she's sheltered, she's fed really good food, she has access to all these books that she's never had access to before. But there is still this layer of prejudice and racism. And, um, you know, they treat Nika's abilities as a heart soother, as a crime yet they're the ones who literally bought a human being. So they're the ones who are committing a crime, which I thought that was pretty ironic. Uh, how did you go about like balancing, I guess, uh, Mimi's generosity with her uh, selfishness and prejudice? Yes, I, I'm i really glad you picked up on that. That's very flattering to me as a writer. But... Something I really wanted to encompass with the entire Komi family was the idea that people with very well-meaning intentions and who do all the right things on paper can still be displaying a lot of biases. And I didn't want to paint them as an antagonist or anything. I think I was just writing honestly from my experience. And in that regard, there's a lot of... um, blunders that they make that they don't even realize are blunders because they're just so unfamiliar with her world and the things that she holds dear. Um, The other thing I really wanted to convey with uh, all of those characters is that they do parallel her in in a way. They lost her parent, their parent, just as she has lost her parents and her grandmother. And, um, you know, one of the characters, Trin, even has a very similar upbringing to her And he was adopted into this wealthy family and given a lot of luxuries that he didn't have before as well. So they all do play off her. But in that way, I think it's very revealing that um, because they didn't have this connection with heart soothing in the way that she does, their lives are very different from her. Um, And and one big theme about this family constantly is that their relationship with her— very much as is America's relationship with its immigrants. It's very contingent on conditions and what services, you know, we as uh, immigrants can offer them. So I think Nika, as she is with this family, she's realizing that even though they've given her a great life, it's not without condition. And she is still trying throughout the novel to find that place of belonging and love that comes unconditionally and doesn't ask anything of her. And, you know, maybe some readers w- might agree, some readers might not disagree that she she does find it at the end of the novel. Speaking of the end of the novel, my jaw dropped by the ending. And I don't want to spoil anything for our listeners out there, but um, it was it was a really powerful ending. So uh, my my question is, was that always the plan or was that an ending that changed a lot when you were drafting without spoiling anything for our listeners? I think it was always the plan for my first concept of the novel. I remember when the novel came about, I did have that scene very specifically in mind. It was just a matter of whether or not I wanted to go through with it. And um, through the the course of writing, I was there were moments where I was chickening out and... Um, And deciding maybe I just want to, uh, you know, end this book here and not, you know, write another book that would, you know, tie it into the ending. That being said, I found a team of uh, agents and editors who were so supportive of the ending. And they made it into something that was better than I could ever conceive. And now that I've written it, I do find maybe it's a polarizing ending, but I don't think in my... If I had to write this on this story honestly and truthfully from my experiences, I think it has to end that way because when I was writing in the place that I was with the the way I was feeling about culture and identity and illness, I think 
that that ending was as close to the the truth of how I was feeling as I could get. So I think it was honest to myself. Um, even if it might make readers a little bit mad, I- I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel like it was honest to Nika's character as well. And I feel like you can have endings like the one that you wrote as long as they stay true to the characters and they and they make sense. Uh, But I was really excited once I read the epilogue because we are getting a book, too. And um, just from like the premise, it's uh, obvious that it's going to be written in Cochin's POV. Um, So can we just kind of ask you, like, what? we can expect without um, any, like, (laughs) big spoilers. (laughs) Yeah, of course. Okay, without spoilers. Um, Well, it it really just takes place uh, right where book one ends. It hits it off again. Um, It is from Cochin's perspective, and I wanted him to show... No, God, no spoilers. I wanted him to show a very unique perspective on um, those same things that Nika is going through, but in almost an opposite way. That's the best I can phrase it without any spoilers. I I mean, that makes sense because they're both... They're both diasporans and diaspora yes. experiences are not monolith. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, exactly. I wanted to show that their experiences with their own backgrounds even if they might be similar and overlapping in some ways, was um, absolutely, in some ways, polar opposites. So the book two will definitely be exploring his um, his battle and his own grappling with his experiences in the backdrop of the war that was so much hinted at in book one. Yeah. All right, so this episode is airing the week that your book comes out. Um, we recorded this a little bit before, but I uh, wanted to ask, um, are you doing anything fun for your for your book launch? Yeah, uh, it, I'm having it at two locations, one here in um, California where I'm going to school the day of, just because I'm still in school when that's happening. Um, and I'm really excited just to uh, be able to celebrate a book coming out into the world. It's not something that I ever really imagined for myself, so... I have to remind myself to like pause and appreciate the the small moments. But I think what I'm most excited for is to go back home and celebrate it with my family just because they were monumental in, uh, well, for one, raising me, but also to just making this book happen in terms of uh, helping my education and cheering me along the way. Um, But I get to launch in a bookstore that I have always loved Powell's bookstore in Portland. Um, and oh, very, very yeah, prolific. That's, yeah. <laughs> it's a dream come true to be able to do that because I grew up in that bookstore, basically, and I love it so much. So being able to have any kind of event there and be, um, you know, invited in as an author and not a reader is kind of a bucket list item that I am really looking forward towards. Yeah. And I guess more more importantly for me and Rira, um, when when can we expect book two? I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, I think um, one year after book one. So March 19th, yeah, 2020. Yeah, it says March 18th, 2025. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So just around <laughs> then we'll get, well, I'll, I'll be, I'll be there um, releasing book two. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Um, it was such an enlightening discussion, and I'm really excited to read book two. I can't wait until 2025. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And that was our conversation with Vanessa Le. Um, you can check out her debut novel, The Last Blood Carver, available now at bookstores everywhere, including, as always, um, the Books and Bubble Bookshop. Um, so head on over to booksandbubble.com, check out our online bookstore. Um, purchases you make there not only help us at Books and Boba, but also your local bookstore. So um, win-win for everybody. Before we call an episode, though, uh, Rira, can you please remind us what we are reading this month for Book Club? Yeah, so this month we are reading Welcome to the Hyunnamdong Bookshop by Hwang Horum and translated by Shanna Tan. And it is a Korean novel about a woman who is burnt out and she moves to a residential neighborhood in Seoul and opens up a bookshop. 
Um, it's a very cozy read, and uh, it's been very popular in Korea and also internationally. Um, it's already been picked as uh, Indie's next pick and um, USA Today's bestsellers list. So, um, yeah, if you have already read the book, uh, please leave your thoughts on our Goodreads forums or our Discord if you are a Patreon member. Yeah, definitely enjoying the cozy vibes, and we invite you to enjoy them with us. But with that, that'll do it for this episode of Books and Boba. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you to Vanessa Lay for chatting with us, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Ri Ryu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about the collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. Hello, I'm Phil Yu, and I'm the host of All the Asians on Star Trek, the podcast in which I interview all the Asians on Star Trek. I'm talking to actors, writers, directors, stunt people, background extras. You know, all the Asians on Star Trek. Find out more at alltheasiansonstartrek.com. Part of the Potluck Podcast Collective. Live long and prosper.